Faders of the Lost Art. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to Faders of the Lost Art, your favorite podcast featuring hosts Ken Lewis, Bob Horn, Fareed Salama, and we've got an extra special guest for you today, the one and only Stephen Slate. He's got tons of accolades under his belt, multiple companies under his belt, bought, sold, created, just about every plugin you can think of. Hardware, software, touch screens, virtual, digital, all of it. Let's see what's in store with Steven. Tune in and uh, let's let's tap in with Steven Slate. See what's going on. Welcome to the show, Steve. Welcome, man. Dude, when is Acoustica going to stop making plugins? Oh, my God. Jam. (laughs) Dude, jam, magic flow. It's like every second there's a new Acoustica plugin. I can't keep up. I just used howie weinberg's plug-in on uh mastering this morning is that cool yeah it's great i have to find yeah. it that's how it's many hard to have, figure right? out there's so many there is and everything i'll there's tell you one hidden. thing i do i do go through the folder and i remove all the the zls the zero latency because uh, what's the point if you uh, if you want that sound get use the full thing you know and at least that makes the list smaller when you're looking at the plugins you know i was cute. always impressed with their output i think they they're pretty amazing how vigilant they are about getting product out. I think that's yeah, it's not I easy. Sure do. That, that product right. doesn't, doesn't come out by itself. You know, there's there's people pushing and working hard to get that stuff out. And true, I'm always uh, I've been a big admirer of that company. Right. There's a I think there's a fine line between getting stuff out on the market and having it out before it's ready. You know, and, and I know a lot, a lot of companies, I've, every company deals with that. It's like, do we put it out yet or do we keep, you know, debugging and stuff like that? So that's one thing I think they could definitely work on a little bit. They're, they do put out a lot of product, but we as the end consumers are kind of debugging. Yeah. On the it, other it, side it of that, my you, system this morning. you'd be surprised at how many times you really do think things are ready. You beta test it for weeks. Everyone gives it the thumbs up. And somehow you miss something and lots of people miss something. We've had that situation a few times and people are like, oh, they're pushing stuff and it's not uh, not ready for prime time. And they're right. It's, it wasn't ready for prime time, but it wasn't an intentional thing. It's it's a tough thing. I mean, is being, being a developer. And then, there, and then there are times where, you know, look, I'll, I'll admit that there were times when, you know, we had a deadline, maybe it was a black Friday or a holiday or something where like, Hey, the, you know, the, the prosperity of the company relies on getting this thing out on this date and they're going to have to be some compromises. So it's all a balance and there's no rule book. And there's no one telling you like, what's the best outcome. You gotta sometimes just have to go with your gut. Right. Any uh, suggestions for say maybe a producer mixer who has an upstart plugin company who's about to put in their second plugin? <laughs> I mean, just you know, uh, just do it, do it, throw it out yeah. there, stand behind we, it, believe we, it, show it off. I mean, you know, I just think that, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a fun industry. There's lots of fun stuff happening, and and you know, it's a, it's a great thing to do. You're making a creative tool for creative people, and you get to watch them use it to make art. I mean, hey, it's a beautiful thing. Congratulations. Thanks, dude. I love your stuff. Thank you. No, facts. I, I was telling Nico uh, earlier, uh, like, it seems like, it feels like I know you just through all the, you know, the ads and the, the just, you're very, uh, you know, in front of your product, you know what I mean? And I think that really connects with the people and the users and, you know, they get to, uh, you explain it pretty well too, you know, like in the, you know, in the promos and stuff like that. So really. Thanks. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you like it. You know, it's not, not always the smartest or easiest thing being the face of the company, but I guess it's worked out for the most part right. in my favor, you know? Yeah. If, if we, if you were taken away from slate and there was just plugins like some other companies, it, w- it would just lose something big. Like there's definitely you be in the face with your personality and you know, the way sometimes you're, you're joking, sometimes you're serious and, and you just really have a bold personality when you do, any of the videos you, you've done on social media, or any advertisements, it's like, it's definitely a thing with, with your company. It's like, it's, it, it feels like, I, I don't know. It's, it's going to be a, it's got to be a connection thing. You know, it's like everybody just, 
feels better about the products, I think, because there's someone that they're talking to, not just a name of a company, you know, there's a person, um, you know. Yeah, I was always happy to, you know, yap about audio stuff. I mean, that's kind of been my life. You know, I'm just an audio nerd like everyone else. And I like talking about stuff, especially stuff that I make and made. And I'm no longer with Slate Digital. And obviously, I'm no longer the face of Slate Digital. I haven't been for a while. But uh, I think they're still going to do great. They don't necessarily, you know, need me yapping about it anymore. I think people get the, the quality of the work that Slate Digital has done and will do. So I think they're going to do they're going to do great. All right, you set the bar for sure. <laughs> so, so can you uh, touch on that a little bit? Like you had like a few Slate companies and you sold Slate Digital and then what? Like, what was the impetus for that, and and where are you going now, and all that? Yeah, so it's two companies, uh, Stephen Slate Audio and Slate Digital. Um, Stephen Slate Audio was actually the original company. It was Stephen Slate Drums and Trigger, and then there was the Stephen the Slate Pro Audio brand, which we made gear, and then the Ravens, uh, and then eventually VSX. So that was always a separate entity, and then the Slate Digital, which is basically all the other plugins and the microphones. Uh, that's what uh, was sold in September. And uh, yeah, so now Steam Slate Audio's remaining products are Raven, VSX headphones, and the drum software, Trigger and SSD. Sweet. My favorite stuff. I got the headphones right there. And of course, I cool. use Trigger on every mix. So yeah, Trigger is still the best the best one of them. Like, it's the most accurate yeah. for me all the time. Yeah. It's been around it's forever, man. It's it's yeah. been around. We got finally have an update coming out. People are like, "Why don't you update this thing?" I'm like, "Cause it 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 works." Right. Yeah. <laughs> it does what it does. We're gonna we'll get we got we've made more sample packs. We will get some new new sample packs coming out. But you know it works. But we do have an update finally coming out of, of both the drums. Oh, wow. Do you with the uh, VSX? Do you guys have any uh, designs on modeling of immersive rooms, Atmos? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. I definitely want to do it. I mean, we have a. a I might as well admit that we have a pretty big VSX update coming out. It's got the next version of our binaural uh, psychoacoustic modeling, binaural perception modeling is what we call it. And it takes it really to the next level. I mean, the the, the realism and clarity is just insane. So now that I, and, and that's kind of where I'm going to stop with the software aspect, because I feel like at that point, I can't really get better in the software. And that's when I'm going to start doing more stuff like the immersive rooms. And, and, and that way I'll have the, 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 the methods and techniques and tools to do it properly. Nice. That's going to be cool. I know a lot of guys, a lot of guys that are mixing on those VSX headphones and getting really good results. Yeah. Um, That's good to hear, man. So, yeah. Hear. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what the immersive brings. Cause they are, they are really impressive headphones. Like I said, a ton yeah. of guys are like, dude, I'm mixing on an airplane. Uh, it's the, like, once you hit that learning curve, it's game over. You know, yes, there's a learning curve. Every speaker has a learning curve. Every set of headphones has a learning curve. Once you get over that, though, that's where these things shine. So, and, and they're so light. I don't know, understand how you guys made them just so. <laughs> that's that's why I use them for tracking. I'm yeah. They're the light. They they like disappear on your head when you have to wear them singing or performing at, at all. They're great. That's good news. Great. I spent a, a lot of time with the hardware team making sure that we found a really light design, and and I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, I mean, there are some headphones that I was checking out, and of course the the, the expensive ones where you feel like you're wearing a head weight, and I'm like, does this make sense? It's like the the, the pro division and the consumer world or very different consumers like let's make it smaller sleeker you know small you know and the the, the pro world like, let's make it thicker fatter heavier let's make the like what cable let's let's just use a freaking rope for a cable yeah right? yeah that's literally. that's really convenient when you're trying to use headphones you know you want a giant rope hanging off your head i mean none of it makes sense but people were eating it up and i was like let me try to stir the pot a little bit like let me try to basically get the thinnest cable i can finally find like, like, give me the greatest wire and wrap it up as thin as possible. I don't even want to know it's there. Uh, <laughs> you know? Fire. Yeah, it feels that way, dude. It's That's insane. I want I want ropes for my speakers and stuff like that. So I'm I'm that guy, you yeah. know, but it's, it's, that's where you, you know. Um, yeah, but Steve, if you want to have it on a speaker versus a headphone, I mean, if you're, you're, right. you're never having to mess around, you know, behind your speakers. But, you know, headphones, you move your head, you're all over the place and just, I don't know. I, it's no, it's a problem, it. but I never like those thick ass cables when headphones and I would trip over them. They would get in my way and knock over my coffee because I didn't see it. it was yeah. <laughs> Spirally even ones to the, are the worst. 
Even to the isolation, they're probably some of the best isolated Ken mentioned for recording. They yeah. isolate really, really well. And that's essential for recording, of course, for that bleed. So well, and then if you gotta mix a record for four hours to eight hours, depending on how fast you are more, it's like you don't want a piece of furniture on your head, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And uh, so quick question. They uh they work uh so is it kind of like how the um the mic works where uh you you have a plug-in that uh and it can work without the plug-in because i know the mic sounds great yeah with or without the emulations and i've yeah, heard yeah. the vsx without the emulations and it sounded sounded pretty good yeah i mean it's it's not bad i mean it, it, it's designed you know the, to be just kind of flat and bland right um, the earlier prototypes had a little bit too much mids and I, I was like, you know what, a lot of emulations are doing stuff with the mids. So I, I, we tuned the driver so that it, it dampened a little bit of that mid range kind of gave a little more of a, of a blank canvas. I mean, that was really the, the, the key. I knew that the, the actual raw headphone was never really totally intended to be listened to without the software, Got you. but it's, it, but it can, you know, it certainly can, but uh, the software, I mean, the HD linear really makes it very flat. Um, and of course, the emulations um, make it flat and sound like a speaker. So yeah, far. the emulations are amazing. Funny enough, I actually love using them as uh, emulating the Sennheiser stuff. That I just I thought it sounded better than my Sennheiser, so I was like, "Yep, oh, yeah. I'm going to start there." And that's kind of what graduated me into it. And I was like, "Okay." I, I took a couple of days on that, and then I was like, okay, I, I get it. You know, that's what I used to wrap my head. And around. I still love the boombox, though. That boombox is useful, man. I'm glad you like that one. Yeah, I, I use that one all the time. I actually use the boombox a lot. I mean, yeah. that's the one emulation where I pop something on. And it's almost always the same problem, too. And this is not going to surprise you. My drums are always too loud, <laughs> you know. And uh, <laughs> and the boombox kind of lets you know that faster than anything because it's so monoized. It's like, right. okay, the snare is louder than the vocal. I got to do something about this. Kicks overpowering. Yeah. Well, one thing about the emulations, though, and tracking, something very interesting happens when you have a vocalist track with them with a speaker emulation, because, you know, without speaker emulation or without crosstalk, you have the image of the sound in your skull. Like the sound sounds like it's coming, you know, it's originating from inside your skull. And it's harder to get intonation for some singers when you do that, whereas the speaker emulation is more, more in front of you. And it's like presented in front of you. So I found that a lot of singers wow. have been telling me that they've been That's getting right. better intonation with these speaker emulations because they can hear themselves clear because they're out of their head. And it's almost similar to when you're on stage and you're singing and there's a monitor there. It's a, right. you know, it's uh, it could be a little easier sometimes. So I, I knew there was a reason I always sing out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> thank you for saving me. <laughs> but well, now, now you need that. to do now your next emulation needs to be two stage monitors on a on a stage with the audience sure. picture of an audience yeah that would be that's a whole nother market right there you get yeah. um the whole um practice room you know practice studio side of things yeah I, i'll tell you one thing that we do have coming out also in the next step that is i'm finally doing a, a cell phone speaker emulation and I thought it was going to be stupid. And I was like, why, why did we even need this? This is like so easy just to check your mix on a phone, but it's so handy. Like it's just, it's just bright and, 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 and small. And it's really <laughs> useful. Yeah. It's actually really useful. Yeah. I, I kind of wanted somebody at some point to make me a table of speakers of like three or four different phones and like the most common things people binge on. So I could just ABC between them, but. I haven't executed that yet, but I still have the idea for it. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah, I was wanted to get a bunch of electronics, like take three Samsung TVs, rip the, the rip the drivers out of those, take you know, just rip the drivers out of a bunch of different things. Obviously, they'll be amped by different stuff, but I, I had that same idea. Go ahead, Bob. No, I was gonna say the same thing, like taking a laptop and just getting XLRs into it somehow and having <laughs> it sit in front of you on your mix desk, you know. So yeah good. we need to make that you know make what that. i i would uh I, would, I like to reference on um sometimes i would reference on the little uh air pods the apple joints but the wired ones oh, oh the wired ones yeah maybe do an emulation of that too <laughs> and those are, right here yeah they're unforgiving in the mid-range bro like oh my gosh 
I like the Apple AirPod Pros because the other ones don't fit in my ear. I need the custom insert to actually get in my ear. <laughs> you gotta yeah, jam. <laughs> yeah if, if I listen to the the wired ones or even the, 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 the second generation, which was the wireless, but they look like the wired ones. Uh, all I hear, all I hear is 2K. <laughs> yeah, because they don't sit right. They don't. They don't. Yeah, I mean, the, the, need- the less it seals in your ear, the the less you're going to hear the very highs and lows. So you're just left with this honky mid. And, yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Apple needs to bring that rubber rim back. That rubber rim on the head on the uh, earbuds was essential. They they'd rip it, you know, peel off or whatever. But that rubber rim was so helpful to seal it in there. But on the, on the new AirPod Pros, they have the little rubber inserts, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're talking about something right. different. I got it. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I. I just think that's that's a, well, that's a whole different, in my opinion. Sticking something that far into your ear is like a different kind of beast. With when the you new, get it, when you get it right, it works. But those things don't stay in my ears at all either. Like, yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. Like I, I, I like a hard plastic. Um, but with the rim on it, because that soft, spongy new, you know, the new stuff is like too spongy, you know, so it's it kind of has that same effect. Well, the key for any in your headphone is you just need a really good seal. And that's the problem. Right. As soon as it doesn't seal, you're hearing things that you're not supposed to hear. You know, exactly. it's the, the wrong frequency response. Um, and over ear headphones have other issues, like for instance, over ear headphones create a chamber over your right. ear, and right. now you have your your inner ear. Uh, shapes or your inner pina uh, resonates and it resonates differently on different people depending on the size depending on how they perceive and, and generally speaking the larger the ear opening the less it will resonate on a center frequency of around three to four kilohertz so that's another reason why in, in vsx we compensate for that we call it the ear profile and it basically uh, controls a curve at around 3.5 kilohertz or at 3.5 kilohertz and uh you know wow Two two people can listen to a speaker, and then they can you know have a have a frequency response of that same speaker. And when they listen to it on headphones, they'll both disagree on what sounds right because one of them might have different inner ear shape, and they're actually hearing more or less of that upper mid range. So it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. No wonder some of my no wonder some of my clients keep changing the mix. Their their ears are <laughs> fucked. Up. I knew it. Right, it's them. Well, what's interesting is, you know, I have a larger inner ear, so I don't hear as much of that upper mid range three to four K as as someone with a you know a smaller ear opening. So there have been certain headphones that are clearly tuned for someone with smaller ear openings than me. So I'll put a certain pair of headphones on, and my my buddy or even one of my guys, uh, Jamie, who works for me, he'll he'll love it. I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm like, Ugh, it's got no detail. There's no stick attack. There's no vocal, and we're both right. Right. Crazy. Matter of how the headphones are tuned. Wow, man! Is, is that why? Does that carry to speakers? Like, do I? I wonder much, how no. differently people hear in general. It, 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 it happens more when you have that driver 180 degrees right in your ear because you create this resonance. Uh, from it, when you have sound waves coming from in front of you, it's a totally different thing. And if you close your eyes and you cover up one ear, you can localize front to back just based with one ear. And the reason is it's because how the sound waves are actually hitting your penis. As soon as, soon as the sound waves hit from this way, your ear knows something is in front of you. So, you you know, some people mistake. They think, that oh, well, you need two ears to localize. You don't. You need one ear to localize. So the brain's pretty smart. The auditory system is pretty evolved. So it knows which way you're hitting it. So when you're hitting it with a driver really close, that's when you're going to start getting resonances uh and that's where the difference w- of an over ear headphone will be noticed i mean your the head way- is basically the speaker cabinet right in right a, in I, one, yes. the yeah. way i kind of when i when i first learned about you guys doing you know different ear profiles and why it was so important and stuff the way i visualized it because i'm a visual you know metaphor guy was kind of like different size funnels so if you put you know if you got a big funnel you put you could pour a little bit more before you got to wait until it goes down kind of thing so people with a smaller funnel or a smaller ear opening kind of have that problem or not that problem just have that difference you just yeah. kind of have to balance it out that way yeah i mean that like it's it's a filter i mean you know you you have uh as the inner walls of that opening come together the filter amplifies resonances and those resonances happen to be around 3.5k now we're still doing studies to 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 better determine these things 
from the best of our knowledge, we've studied about two to 400 people at some point. I can't remember exactly how many people we polled. Uh, it seems like that center frequency of 3.5K is the best way to do it. And that's kind of what is most amplified or not amplified, depending on that ear opening. Yeah. So here's a question for Stephen. I met Stephen's. I met Stephen Slate uh, first time at an epic Christmas party at NRG where I almost got bitten by a reindeer. And my question is, <laughs> how is that reindeer these days? Yeah, I like to do reindeers at holiday parties. I think when, when I was a kid, uh, I remember watching the Rudolph. Was it a cartoon or was it like, the, like a claymation kind of thing? Yeah, Rudolph oh, yeah, yeah. reindeer. Yeah, yeah anyway, you know, a cartoon. I mean, maybe I saw both. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, reindeers are, are a very festive little holiday animal and so i like when i throw holiday events to make sure i have a reindeer and, and usually a santa so that tradition has been going on a long time um, I think nice. the first time i did a reindeer was 2011 and we had one last yep. year too i had a small get together and we got a reindeer <laughs> <laughs> so dope are we getting more reindeer the best in parties. The future? what's that we throw the best parties oh thanks bob we should come to the next one I, w- I will if there's reindeer, now that I heard that. um, I want to ask everybody, I, and I kind of want to open this, and this kind of topic comes up a lot, especially these days. A lot of engineers are doing everything from production to mastering or, you know, the recording guy is now mixing, and that's fucking amazing. How do you guys handle competition? What do you think, you know, my outlook is there's enough work for everybody, but what do you guys think? And how do you handle competition, Stephen? Be it business, entrepreneurial, other companies, us engineers, producers, Ken. You know, how do you guys handle competition? Obviously, we gotta always think we're the best. But I mean, if you're good, you're really only competing against yourself. I mean, there's there's should be plenty enough work to go around, and you know, if you know how to get it, and people have trusted you before. And, you know, like I have mixing nights, so I'm putting myself out there regularly. We all have faders of the lost art. So, you know, we're doing things to kind of keep ourselves in the public eye while we're trying to do our best work behind the scenes and stacking credits. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I mean, I think about the competition sometimes, but I, I honestly just try to make myself stay young minded and, and have my finger on the pulse of what's hot right now and just, keep up to date with production trends, mixing trends and stuff. And that, sometimes I feel like that's all I can do, you know, like out outside of, you know, paying for somebody to, to kill your competition, you know, Hitman or something. I, I don't know what else you can really do except just be the, be the best version of yourself. You know? <laughs> um, be better than you were two months ago, you know. Well, Bree, you said something about knowing a guy in Miami, right? <laughs> hey, look, man. Hey. on the business side of things you have to be aware of competition because you got a lot of mouths to feed you, you make a wrong move and someone clobbers a product that's making the company money you know that that's a serious thing it's a lot, lot a lot of people rely on you know good decisions coming from the top so i was always and i still i mean i still run you know students that audio i'm always aware of of or try to be aware of what's going on in the industry and you know it, it, it's an exciting thing for me because it always forces you to keep thinking smarter better faster and what's the next thing and i i think i, I pride myself on never resting on something um you know vsx is a good example i mean i could have just kind of let it ride but i've got a lot of cool ideas happening we're, we're keeping them moving and if someone did come out with the competing product which they have i mean there's a acousca for instance came out with the, the, the competing product but you know we try to always stay on top and, and keep moving things and, and keep a good conversation with our users so we understand what they need and yeah that's a i i would say that to sum it up it's healthy competition is a healthy thing for a business uh it should not keep be ignored. On yeah, should shouldn't be ignored, should be respected, and and it ultimately drives you to keep on improving. Yeah, it's a whole different responsibility when you got a whole camp of people who are uh, relying on you to steer the ship. So sure, uh, I just got right, and I think just stuff. like you said, I think it's healthy. I think if there wasn't any competition, things would get very lax, and uh, you know, it, it it's almost like. 
you know, I, I see you guys as like, my competition. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you know, I want to do great work so that I can hang with other people who do great work. And I know that all of you guys strive for the same things I do. So, I mean, that's, I think in the end of the day, you just want to surround yourself with talented people and you want to be respected by your peers and, you know, be able to turn on the radio and hear your work and be proud of it. And, right. And, uh, yeah. I mean, early, I th- early 2000s, I think engineers were even more competitive uh, sure. and secretive. And I knew guys that would put, you yeah, walk into look- the control room for a visit <laughs> and they'd put a piece of paper over a piece of gear. Like they didn't want anyone to know those setting except the assistant. And, you know, I think, awesome. I always kind of thought maybe Pensado's place and some of the the yeah. YouTube stuff made the impetus for people to share more. And then, of course, you know, a couple of years ago, Clubhouse, all these engineers telling each other what we do and learning everything. And I think it just became a more friendly, open company. And it for definitely for myself, it just helped me grow. Like I welcome, you know, I, I don't, I don't, even though everyone's competition, I like to, be friends with all the engineers because it helps me to learn the most you know let's see i i'm older than all of you youngsters and i remember the old days in new york city where you would get that experience because there were 100 studios in new york and if you were working at hit factory then you were in a and somebody else that you knew was in b c d and e and you could see your friends whenever you were at electric lady or sony or hit factory or something like Mm -hmm. that and you would exchange ideas, sure, and, ideas and, and keep in touch with everybody and network and grow that way. And then like the 2000s, when things started going more Internet, then it everything became more separated. And we all started kind of working in our own spaces. And, and then the whole community of the uh, studio industry changed. It wasn't yeah. like that at all. Speaking about that, that secretive vibe, uh, I remember when I first started, you know, doing the drum sample thing. There was at least one or two producers like, hey, we'll, I'll, I'll pay you if you don't give this sample to anyone else. I, I want to have the exclusive rights to this sample, you know, so no one else can have this snare sound. Uh, and it's never- still that way, I think. I've heard that. I've heard then that someone, around the way. Did once, then someone get sued uh, for using a certain snare sound in like a, in a dance track like Five years ago or something like that. Well, let's get let's get into AI. AI is supposedly getting really good with the sampling stuff. So our, our favorite topic. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> exactly. Let's see what happens. Um, so far, obviously, it hasn't happened, but I think it was something like an AI had found a snare sample in somebody else's record and they're kind of in litigation about it, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's gonna happen more and more for sure. It's a wrap. Yeah, no question. As soon as the algorithms get written better to search in ways that the sample heads, you know, sampled and flipped and recreated shit, then there's going to be a cottage industry of new lawsuits popping up of people who could hide things before, but that are getting revealed now. That's going to suck. And but, well, I guess it's it really involves the litigation and how the laws are written or how they're interpreted and the the case you know case scenarios and stuff like that. I hope there's a statute of limitations on things like that. Right. If exactly. there is, then most of that will just go by the wayside. Exactly. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll so yeah, but there still is a lot of sample hoarding. I I, I feel that way at least. Yeah, um, Stephen. Splice, what what, what AI are you uh, excited about? And what are... I'm excited about all of it. I mean, uh, some people fear what AI does. I'm thrilled about it. I think there's some cool things that can happen. It, I think it's going to separate the music creation industry. Well, not separate. It's going it, to it's going to introduce a new breed of of music creators who aren't looking to be engineers or to do this professionally. They just want to have fun. They want to make some art. They want to, you know type in a mood and get some vibey music that goes along with it and create and, and, and have fun with it. And that's okay. Uh, I don't, I, I embrace that. I'm not scared of it. I don't, I don't dismiss it or belittle it. Um, but you know, look, there's gonna be some really cool AI tools that help, you know, people who, who maybe aren't advanced in, in, in audio engineering to make music. That's also gonna be very helpful for pros uh, for a number of reasons. Like, Hey, let me, you know, uh, automate a bunch of certain tasks and have this AI learn what I usually do so that I can be more productive. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's, 
you know, uh, coming up with ideas. You know, if you're a producer, you know, maybe some of these AIs can listen to some of your previous work and help you conjure up some new ideas and, and, and you know, be, be more creative. And some people say, oh, well, that's cheating. But I don't know. I think that, look, at the end of the day, we're just we're making art and there's different roads and paths to get there and whatever it works. Yep. Different, you know, modern tools for modern records, right? Um, you got to get with the times. When the smartphone first came out, people were like, why do I need a TV on my phone? You know, so I definitely think AI is the very same. You know, I was having a conversation yesterday with somebody about this. It's very similar. The people that adapt to it and get there faster are the ones who are going to succeed. And the people that resist, obviously, are going to fall by the wayside. So, um, you know, I, I'm right there with you, Stephen. You got to embrace it. You got to take the new tools that are coming, learn them, use them to your advantage to, like you said, gain more time to then produce more records if you're now producing records faster. To then, you know, get to your end result faster so you can create more. Also yeah. help other people get to that creative space. You know, there's I can't tell you how many millions of people you tapped on that, you know, that would love to create just don't have the time or the know-how right, to just the, sit here and learn at all. The hobbyist mentality, I think, is going to be the real flourishing thing with AI for sure. Well, you, we've already seen this in the video world. I mean, you know, I've seen some videos made by teenagers that 10 years ago would have required a $10,000 budget of professional editors and equipment to do. And now they're More. shooting on their iPhone Editing, yep. editing in various apps and TikTok and making these, you know, really cool little mini films. And they're really, really good. Right. Uh, I think you're, we're going to see something similar like that with music creation. And uh, it just comes down to is, look, we got to we got to check our egos at the door. The people who are, are most fearful or actually they're they're against AI when it comes down to it, if you really look into it, they are fearful because they think it's going to replace them. And they think it's going to, they think, you know, if this is respected, therefore I'm going to be disrespected. My, my knowledge, know-how and expertise is going to be disrespected because this machine can do what I do and therefore I hate it. And I'm going to try to dismiss it and belittle it. And that's just not the best way to, you know, that that's proven in history to never really work. Be a good approach, right? right? Yeah. When, when, Especially when you, with new emerging tech. Yeah. Well, if you look at if you look at the the pat when you know outside of outside of uh, plugins and engineering and stuff like that, if you look at what AI has done for technology, like with you know toll workers, you know now there's no more toll workers. There's just you know tolls that you know. So if you look at that concept, it does replace jobs, but if we use technology more to do more of the grunt work more of the heavy lifting like the possibilities are endless like think of where our focus would be where we're, our minds would be you know the kind of uh hobbies like you guys were saying or the kind of ideas we'd be focusing if we don't have to focus on all the grunt work and all the little stuff you know what i'm saying uh I guess in, in I guess in audio world that would apply to like noise floor, you know, all kinds of other stuff, you know, like little things that we could could uh you're you're taking so much time thinking about that and working on that that you're missing out on the bigger picture. Like I watch Zeitgeist, I'm a big uh, you know, I'm a big conspiracy buff, you know, if you guys don't know that about me yet. But um there there's that there's that theory that, you know, People, people are scared that if they stop working, then we'll all get lazy, you know, or if the jobs are taken away, we, you know, what well, do the, we do? It's a fact that AI is going to put a lot of people out of work and it's going to happen right. in the music industry too. It already has happened in the music right, industry. Right, it has. It's, it's going to keep getting happened. worse, but that's going to open up other opportunities. And the question is, are you going to be one of those who succumbs to it and just accepts that? Or are you going to be one of those who learns it and pivots and figures right. out how to. Yeah, you know, exactly. Where do we evolve? Pivots, embraces, figures out how to work the system with you in it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And it, it's, it goes back to the, the competition discussion. Right. In a weird way, you, you know, you, you have to learn how to deal with your competition and use it. And 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 use it, and just let people are gonna have to do the same thing with these different technological tools and AI tools. You know, it's either gonna replace you, or you're gonna figure out how to game the system and and, and work with it and 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 use it for your advantage. Hundred percent. And anybody who may be your competition is certainly doing that. Right. right. 
<laughs> with, you know? with that being said, what do you think it takes to be an entrepreneur in the music business today versus idiocy uh, 10 years ago or even more? I think you that know, I, uh, it's yeah. you just got to be be a fighter. And it's the same thing in my side of the business. You just, you know, I, I tell my guys every day I wake in the morning, we're in battle. We're in battle with so many different things. We're in, we're in battle with just the, the the development process, our manufacturing plants going, having problems, our shipping, our, you know, co-development bugs. We're in the battle with customers who are happy or unhappy about a certain thing that we've got to take seriously. We're in battle with our competition. It's like, you know, look, to, to, to really win in any game, like you got to go there and You've got to have sword in hand ready to go. And if if you if you you know think you can sit there and twiddle your thumbs and have success, it's just not a reality. So I think uh, more so than ever now, there's so many people trying to do what what we do and what you do and what I do that you gotta you gotta be in battle mode. And one you know one of the things with that is uh, I totally lost my train of thought. Jesus, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All good, my, point, my point of view is like you you definitely have to specialize in what you do but you can't just do one thing anymore and expect everything else to fall into place 100%. you have to be like the everything guy right you've got to do your own taxes and set up be your own assistant and kick your own ass in the gym and you know, all these sort of things that, you know, we used to be able to think we could just, oh, if I'm just a good mixer, if I'm just a good producer, if I'm just a good developer, then, you know, I could pay somebody to do everything else, of course. Well, and the thing I was thinking of is you got to work for years before you expect real success to come. And you have to work focused for years, believing in yourself and your product or your skills or whatever it is before you really are going to be able to see the returns that you hope for and if you don't stay the course you're not going to get there somebody else is going to stay the course and do it and, and being willing to reinvent yourself oh, yeah God. man I, it's easy to get punches. i tell everybody it's so easy to get burnt in this industry man you know especially when you're going 12 16 hours a night you know tracking in front of a screen it's just bright you know like if you don't if you don't take some time reset you know, uh, put, you know, make sure your sleep is important. Sleep's very important, you know, because you don't want to burn yourself out five, six years into it. And then you're like, oh, fuck this. I don't want to do this. You, you know, know, another big issue is when somebody catches really big success and then the they don't realize in the moment how lucky they were to have caught that and how the next one is not going to be anywhere near as easy to get. And you got to go fucking get it while you're hot. And a lot of people right. take that success and kick back and relax for a while. Right. And right. then a year or two down the road, nobody gives a shit about them. They're like, oh, my God, what now? Like, you're done. So Right. It's like you got signed and, and then then you think, OK. Yeah, the, the record deal is step one. So as soon as you get that record deal, you got to figure out how to double down and work twice as hard as you did to get the deal. Because yep. the deal right. ain't success. Yeah, I've heard that from yeah. all every label, every meeting I've been in. You've got your whole life to make your first record then you got one year to make the next one totally to make your next hit nowadays. so so yeah. steve uh i was i'm trying not to geek out you know i had so many questions <laughs> but um because i've been a big fan of your plugins man um i don't know how much uh you can still talk on the plugins or what but uh like i like a lot of my favorites was like the vtm the virtual tape machine i just love the sound of that um uh the, Me too. the vg mu you know the the, the virtual bus compressors and those were some of like the earlier plugins you know and like i don't i don't know what was the thought process how did you guys were you guys one of the first companies using oversampling also because i remember your plugins just sounding different they just jumped out i i don't i mean no there's a bunch of companies using oversampling and i don't think that's really what separated us right uh, Qualiver plugins, not not to say you know, there's a lot of great plugins out there even at that time, uh, but I think we were really driven to compete because we were the new ones in town and like we were, you know, competing against UA and Waves. There was like those were the two big ones right. at the time, 
And uh, we want we needed to prove that our analog modeling was as good or better. And I said the way to do that to my partner at the time, Fabrice, as I said, we have to do an AB that's blind, and no one should be able to tell the difference between the real thing and the plugin. And we achieved that. Like VTM, we did that test four or five times before, prior to the release. One was with Jay Baumgartner, who owns the two-inch Studer machine that we used. Uh, he couldn't identify which was which in a blind test. And the other one was Howie. Then we, I think we did the same thing with Ross Hogarth. And then we had a few engineers at an NRG listening party where we did the same thing. And when, in a blind test... In a really good sound studio room, people couldn't tell the difference. And that's how we knew we, we we had something. And to get there was a lot of work. You know, at that time, we didn't have any deadlines. We just kind of produced till it was ready. And I think the BTM took well over a year. And I mean, there was thousands of prototypes made and thousands of, you know, demos that we would A-B and like, nope, not there yet. And then we take two steps forward and then three steps back. And okay, now the low end glue is right, but the top end clearly not the same. And just a lot of that. And we were just really driven to prove ourselves. So I think that's the best answer I can give you. No, you guys killed it with that, man. Definitely. Uh, I definitely liked uh, like the joint ventures you would do also like with the uh, e EOSIS, like the Air EQs and the, and the, um, the DS. Sure, yeah. I think I, think I still yeah, big use shout out, Big shout out for Fabrice. Day. But yeah, Fabrice Gabriel, right? Uh, super fire, man. Yeah, uh, y'all did great with that. Behind the FGX also, right? I think, or was part of that. Yeah, I just got FGX too. I'm starting to use that. But I think I use virtual mix rack almost every mix. No, for sure. That thing is you know, serious. Just so, a good Swiss Army knife tool. I have a question. What what would make you want to make a plugin that maybe somebody already has an emulation? Like you said, you're competing with UA and Waves. Um, other than just we gotta have this, you know, what kind of is like your okay, this has to be our next product, or hey, why don't we do one of these? Well, we try to do things a little differently. You know, with the virtual bus compressor as an example, I was like, hey, you, you know, one of the things I always wondered at the time when I was making records, I was like, man, I I, I would always want to kind of swap out the, the master bus compressor, figure out which one was vibing the best with this with this mix. So having, you know, the, the initial idea with the virtual bus compressors was putting them all in the same plugin and being able to easily ABC. And I still find that so helpful to this day. Because every once in a while, I'll just mess with those. And all of a sudden, like, I'll throw the FG Mu on. And that beats the 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 gray compressor, which is basically an SSL emulation. Right. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. It's just, I don't know, I thought, you know, we, we try to do things a little different is, is really the point. Um, I like that. New, tracks, new and innovative, different. you know. That's yeah. what we need. And that's that's I think that's what attracts so many people to your products is, like, new and innovative it's like yeah these people have one those people have one but ours does this or ours has a mix knob or you could swap these around you know that's kind of something and and like we were talking earlier you take the feedback and just boom very next update very next week or whatever is out you know it's like damn i didn't even blink it or they already fixed it you know so paying attention to that i think is essential regardless of how many others there are out there getting it right and getting it done right, I think it says a lot. Sure. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Even even the microphone, the microphone was was amazing. I still have the the first one, the first black one. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I love VMS. I'll be yeah. about to use it right after this. Got to do some videos. Yeah. I so was I VMS see. part of uh Slate Digital or Slate? Well, yeah, it was Slate Digital. Oh, okay, gotcha. So now, now I get to use it as a, a fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I use that so thing I'm... without the emulations too. Yeah, no, this is great. It's a great mic. Um what are you guys' favorite emulations on on it? The eight hundred. Yeah, but has... there's two eight hundreds. There's the there's yeah. a yeah, so I'll tell you a story about the eight hundreds. Um so the 800 we initially modeled was, I guess it's supposed to been 2015 or 2016. It was a new in the box Sony 800G. Yeah. And it was so bright that 
I really thought it was broken. I didn't believe that. I, I had never really encountered too many 800s in my world. I was like in the studios where everyone was using, you know, 47s and C12s and 251s and 48s. And I just never really was in the, you know, that modern pop circle where everyone was using the 800. So I, that was like one of my first times really like hearing one. I was like, dude, this is so freaking bright. Um, but we modeled it and it was, and it is very, very bright. And then all of a sudden one, who was it? My friend Jenzo, I can't remember who it was. And was like, Hey, this thing is way brighter than my 800. I'm like, dude, I'll, I send, I'll send you <laughs> files. Here's the AB files. And he's like, yeah, no, that sounds exactly the same. He's like, well, let, let me bring over my 800 and his 800, I think was from 2001. So 14 years prior or something, something around there. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, it was the same character of Mike, but way less bright. And I was like, okay, we got to model this one. Cause I, I, uh, apparently what ha- what happens is either Sony was doing something different later on in the production. Maybe it was a capsule. Maybe, I mean, it could, there's so many things in a mic that right. determine the sound. I mean, yeah. they yeah. go, oh, it's the capsule or the tube. It can, like, literally the, the capsule capacitors can change the sound completely. So either way, we we modeled the the other eight hundred. That's the M version, which is more mellow, and I I love that one. That one I really is that love. is that is that the M? Yeah, that's the M. That's I my think, favorite. I think his uh, his version sounded better because it had some Eric Clapton spit on it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was taught. That's yeah. so wild. You said that though, because we have like three three C eight hundreds here at Criteria, and we yeah. I literally have to, you know, you take note of the barcode. Because oh yeah, you want to use that, you know. Man. My C eight hundred G is mid nineties, immaculate, Classic. Classic. still <laughs> sounds incredible. <laughs> like the day I bought it, man. Amazing. Yeah, I, I just think that either they're brighter when they're new, or which is less likely, more likely, small changes happen over a twenty year production span, where the sound of the mic changes. And the twenty fifteen model was, it's bright. I mean, you can hear it in VS VMS. It's right right and you know not to knock on anyone but uh, i've heard the like the solid state stuff like the you know like the it's just not it for me compared to the you know the warm audio stuff is cool and uh, you know but i I really i just i can't get over the original sound and it might be like what you said the the older sound of the mic you know what i mean the older version of the mic these are these are two completely different times and questions but what got you into mic modeling? Like, what made you say, okay, you know what? We're going to tackle this beast. And what got you into headphone modeling? You know, what, what kind of broke that? Press? Sure. So when I was, you know, in my late teens and, and interning at various studios that would have, like, incredible mic lockers, you know, 47s, 251s, C12s. And then I'd kind of go to my home studio, and I had, like, a short KSM 27 or something like that which by the way is not a bad mic but like i I just always kind of had microphone envy yep and you know you're taught young that these microphones are like magic they're like they're wizardry and as i started getting into digital audio development you start to uncover you know what's behind the emperor's clothes and it's not magic it's not wizardry it's it's stuff that you can see, measure, and recreate. And I started to analyze. I had a, I had my own U forty seven at the time, and I started just to run some analysis on it. And I, I I I can't remember if I already built up a little bit of a prototype of a solid state microphone that like I think I did actually. And I started to to run some tests through both mics to try to figure out what's the difference here. And as I started looking at what the differences are, I'm like, this is kind of the stuff that we already read, we do in our analog modeling. I mean, it's, you know, it's filters, it's saturation, harmonic response, it's phase, it's all these different things. I'm like, we could probably do this if we had a starting point that was high bandwidth enough. So we have the data. And then really what the model is going to be about is it's going to be about shrinking that data into what this microphone sounds like. So at one point I was like, I think we can do this. And then, and then our first, th- th- then we built the prototype of the microphone, uh, a better prototype, you know, not, not the first one I think was like some little proof of concept solid state mic that we figured out. 
Uh, but when we built the final prototype, uh, built a prototype of the microphone, we did a model of my U forty seven, and it was so dead on. And that's when I was like, "Wow, we got this. We got we something crazy, yeah. man." And then um, moving that to headphones, what made you say was, like, "Uh huh"? Th that's a whole different ball game because the headphones are doing binaural sound, and I was not a believer in binaural sound at the time. I didn't think it was good i didn't think it could work i thought it just sounded very fake right i didn't know much about it and then i saw how many of my employees struggled to like just you know we, we had this perfectly tuned studio at slate digital and i was spoiled by it I've, I've been spoiled by perfectly tuned studios for a long time. I mean, one of my first studios in LA, Bob Hodes tuned it. It was like ruler right. flat. But I mean, it, I mean, there's so much bass trapped in that, that that room. It was actually too dry because there was so much absorption. But it was flat, and and you could trust stuff that went in and out of it, you know. Right. Uh, but I just saw what a problem this was. I mean, this was the ultimate problem. I I, I, I saw that like you know the, the biggest problem between most people and great mixes is not access to great gear or access to great plugins. There's loads of that stuff out there or even great speakers. It's trusting the speaker in the room. Right. And as I start, started to see more of that issue, I'm like, this is really the ultimate problem I have to tackle. This is probably the biggest reason why people can't get pro sounding mixes because they're, you know, firing stuff out in their home studio, not realizing that, you know, they've got no 60 or no 80 or, or, or a huge resonance at, at 150 that they're, you know, compensating for by mixing barely any bass in their mix. Right. And, uh, so I just wanted to tackle it. And I thought, man, if binaural sound in a headphone could work, it would be really cool. And that's what got me starting to study it. And the first generation was not bad. And it's 3.0, I think is a lot better. I think 3.5 will be even better than that. And kind of on this journey to, to give people accurate representation of not only just one speaker, many different speakers, so they can really get an idea of what their mix is, gonna, is actually sounding like. So you can trust that it's going to translate everywhere and to me that's that's the biggest problem and it, it stems from actually my first mix ever in like the mid mid 90s mid late 90s uh where i had this band and i had a a cassette four track and i made this mix in my basement on alesis monitors with no there's no there's no, no absorption or room acoustic treatment just basement i got it sounded really good and then I called over my bandmates and I said, let's all uh, take a listen to this. We listened to my studio. I was like, yeah, it sounds really good. And then we went in the car to get some burgers or something like that, threw in the car, pressed play. And it was like the audible version of a, a diarrhea. And I was like, wait, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and like, that's a core memory that, that I, I, that a lot of people have, have been through. PTSD you know? right there. Like, you know, uh, she'll never happen again. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so when you do these new version updates, you have, Obviously, you have new rooms that you add to it. Are you also tweaking the binaural algorithm that you have going as as you yeah. do new versions? Do you change things? Well, I mean, it's yes and no. I mean, what happens is I I have a never ending path to study up on binaural audio, psychoacoustics, the human auditory system, room modeling, and I keep finding out through study how it works. And the better I know more about how it works, the better I can apply that to the methods, techniques, and tools we use for VSX. Can we just real quick, sorry not to interrupt, can we real quick just explain the difference between binaural and stereo, just for anyone who's, who's watching that doesn't really get that? Sure, idea. yeah, but binaural just relates to how we hear with our two ears. Um, so let's you talk about- two, You need two ears for this part. Guys. Yes. <laughs> so so if we to talk about you know stereo versus binaural let me present it in terms of like a headphone so if you listen to a regular headphone you've got sound going in your left ear sound going in your right ear so you have discrete left and right channels um when you listen let's say to a speaker uh, you hear the left speaker with both your left ear and your right ear, and you hear the right speaker with both your left ear and your right ear. And you have a filtering and, and delay coming from each ear from each source. So that what I mean by that is you'll have uh, your left speaker goes to your left ear, and then 
it goes to your right ear, but there's a slight time delay because the left speaker is closer to your left ear. And not only is there a time delay, but it's also not, you know, hitting your right ear uh, um, directly. It's kind of going through your head and your skull. And all of these things filter the sound. So this is called head-related transfer function. And so binaural recreates all of these auditory cues and recreates head-related transfer function and recreates this virtual crosstalk. And that's what creates binaural sound. And it's supposed to represent things as we hear them. And it actually starts out with a very unique type of microphone called a binaural mic. And the binaural, binaural head, uh, Neumann, right? No, they... Neumann makes one. There's a few companies who make one. And Fire. That, that gives you a decent starting point, at least, for binaural sound. Six, Hopefully six, I explained that okay. No, you so is that what you use to capture the speakers? Like, let's say the, the Prius emulation or the NRG emulation. Did you put a binaural head? The yeah, the, the first thing we do is we start with a binaural uh, head, and we we have that as our first chunk of data. The problem with the binaural head is, is it's almost like if I was saying that I want to carve, or if I want to have a statue of David, the binaural head gives you a block of marble, and from that in that block of marble somewhere there's a statue of David, but you know, have to know how to carve it to make it look like David, because you know the binaural head gets you. Gets you the starting line, but you have a hundred yards to go before it actually sounds like something right. we hear. Actually, right. And and Very binaurals come a long way. For all the folks who don't know and want to get into it real quick, just put on a set of headphones and Google the virtual barber. Is that is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. You know, you'll you'll hear the guy giving you a haircut or whatever. <laughs> um, so for all of you guys out there that don't know anything about binaural, Google the virtual barber. Both. But yeah, I mean, the, wow. wh where you guys have come with it is insane. I mean, just the fact that you can sit in your car and mix and not know you if you have headphones or not, that's just nuts to me. Like the Tesla is creepy, creepy good. It's yeah, insane. I love the Tesla. Great for Lowe's. Um, I'm actually glad you said that. I'm As soon as this call is done, with one of the updates that I'm working on is I'll probably throw the Tesla in, in the past today. Oh, dope. Yeah, that that one is spot on. It's crazy. Um, good, any, I, any, I, I hope um, I don't destroy it for the three point five version. But having <laughs> said that, all, all the three point zero versions will be available. It's just going to be you'll be able to click which version of the speakers you want to use. But I think that three point zero is great. I love it. I think three point five is going to also be a nice boost. So dope. You guys really uh went into Mike Dean's Tesla. Oh yeah. <laughs> How dope, man. <laughs> Well, first we had to fix it. <laughs> I don't know if Mike wants to be telling the story, but I mean, <laughs> his thirty thousand dollar West Coast custom system, and um, one of the amps blew. So, like, <laughs> we're like Mike, we need to model this Tesla. He's like, "Well, go to <laughs> fix it." So, next thing you know, <laughs> me and uh, two of my guys were at West Coast Customs, and we we're like, we arranged to have his car fixed. And uh, nice. Yeah. Great system. Though. Why? Why am I not surprised that Mike Dean is blowing amps? That's not surprising. <laughs> He's testing out the gain station, probably. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I think it was an amp. It was either an amp, or I, I think it was an amp. I think we had to swap yeah, out. I'm, listen, I'm not surprised at all. I yeah. mean, that is that is the loudest, mm -hmm. loudest system. I mean, his room is so loud; it's it, it's incredible. So it's safe to say his Tesla isn't stock. It's not a stock system. No, no, it's okay. Not, very okay. far from stock. Got you, very got far, you. Very far. <laughs> cool. Oh man. So, Fareed, since you're the conspiracy guy, is the world flat? No, I'm <laughs> not a flat earther. Okay, <laughs> I'm not a flat earther, man. Just checking, just checking. I think, I think, dude, I think we should have a fight between regular conspiracy guys and flat earther conspiracy guys. And yeah, they don't, they don't, them. they don't. Really whoever's the winner of that can kind of come to the forefront. They're passionate. They are passionate. I'll, I'll tell yeah. you guys what I think is a funny story. You know, I I, I have a pretty heavy work day, and like we all do. Uh, but for a while, to to just kind of take a recess take a break i went on this i joined the flat earther facebook group <laughs> entertain myself just for laughs and, I, just, and I, I i'd even post under my own name by the way i don't know if this group even still exists but i would just post the most and i would just 
join in on this ridiculous commentary and i just got really self-entertained i mean i'm, I'm i don't know i'm like a, a five-year-old sometimes <laughs> super, super entertained by it and i really enjoyed it and it just gave me a good 10 minute break and a good laugh to myself so i can go back and tweak some more headphone algorithms that sounds like some lou would do right definitely yeah we we had a we had a uh flat earth clubhouse and we'd all oh, change our pictures and <laughs> and we got hundreds of people in there at times just going at it heavy. And we're uh, just literally yeah. just going fishing, see what see see what sticks. You'd be the surprised OBS all the dropping. You'd be surprised all the facts you learn and all the things you never knew. <laughs> I think crazy. the funniest thing was the Netflix documentary where they spent all this time and money trying to prove that there's no curve. And at the very end, the test that they actually use You see the curve. There's a curve. <laughs> I was like, this is that is just too great. I, I could not believe that. Wow. God, Speaking of conspiracy theories, what does everyone think about the subscriptions versus the old perpetual stuff? I know Steven, you got to deal with this and hear what gripe from everybody. So please well, tell not us more. <laughs> okay. Uh, um what 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 does everyone think about that? I'm I'm 50-50. Listen. As much as I, I love a perpetual paying one time thing, I don't want to pay for updates. So shit, I'll pay a little bit at a time on a payment plan, if you will. You know, I, I like both being available because some things like, for instance, Antares are great for subscription, you know, but other things I just want to buy once and be done because I, I buy so many plugins. I literally have like a thousand plugins. And if I had to have subscription, on all of those, I'd be dead. Like, like, okay, which credit card is this gonna ping at the end of this month? Like, holy shit, you know. So I like both being available personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll give you guys some context. I mean, we were one of the first companies to do plug-in subscriptions. I think we actually were the first one. Um, and at the time, plugins were one forty nine to three hundred bucks each. Mm-hmm. Even Waves, I know Waves is all $29, but again, this is back in the day, that wasn't the case. I mean, a single Waves plugin was, you know, good 200 bucks and their bundles were big. Their Mercury bundle was over 10,000. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, Slate Digital, we had a bunch of plugins at the time and they were, you know, 149, 200 bucks. And, and I would get emails from customers like, oh, you know, I'm really saving up for your, for VTM. Or I'm saving up for VMR. And, you know, these were, these were expensive purchases for people. You know, so when we launched our subscription, it was it was really cool that you know we had several thousand dollars worth of plugins all of a sudden available for at the time it was twenty bucks a month. So it was just the, the the value proposition compared to what was out there was really really great, and it caught on super fast. I mean, it, it, just like digital subscription is massive, People, so many right. subscribers. You know, and then we just, yeah. and then we funneled back in that investment, you know, and we reinvested that money and we're able to, you know, put out a lot more stuff, do licensing deals with third party companies and provide just this massive amount of tools for very low money. And eventually we even lowered the price. And, you know, I think <clears throat> by the time when I left Slate Digital, I mean, I think it's still the same price. It was 10 bucks a month for the first six months and then 15 bucks a month. And it's like, now it's not only just plugins, but you get classes, you get sessions, right. down, you get sampler packs, you get the best deal. massive synthesizer. So like, it was just so much for the price of like two lattes at Starbucks. So I mean, I think we were, we were doing it right. And they are still doing it right. It's like digital where they're, 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 they're value. Subscriptions work when your value to cost ratio is in the positive right. where you have a lot more value than cost. Exactly. Where it doesn't work is when it's the opposite, where where you're paying a lot and you're just not getting enough value. Like for instance, if you only have like one plugin and you're subscribing to one plugin for the rest of your life, that doesn't really make sense unless that plugin right. is updated and constantly improves. Um, but but when you do it right, it 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 works pretty well. But I can completely see what Bob's saying. Like you know, if every company did this, this would be a catastrophe. Right. I, I like the rent to own stuff. Splice has been doing too. I think that's kind of cool. Oh yeah, yeah. That's I know it's great. not on every plugin. I, you know, I think the the update thing is a huge deal. It's like I think it really depends on how often you update. If you update your shit all the time, you're adding shit all the time. Then you know a subscription brings value to the table. But 
other than that, I think, you know, rent to own. And I do love the fact that everybody can choose their own things so that n not one thing is killed. But if it's an old plugin or it's something that's not constantly getting updated, then why you, need you know, you, you, it's a rent to own is kind of like, you know, I think everybody should have all the options. It's kind of what I'm saying. Facts. Facts. I agree. It's like back in the day, uh, I don't know the whole updating you know, thing was not really uh, embraced like that. You know, there if it's not broke, don't fix it. Like you said earlier, you well, know, a lot of people now we got so many OS updates that we have yeah. to. So whether that's whether and that, and that's where it really sucks for the manufacturers and the plugin companies because they don't have an option. They have to 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 bite that um, development bullet or whatever. You know, all that processing, coding, and all that stuff. Crazy. So. Actually, Ken and Stephen uh, would be able to answer this. Do you think, I always wondered this, do you think uh, Artaz, BST, AU, do any of them sound different? Hmm. I've never, I think that's more of a Stephen question. I've never put them A, B to, to find out. Yeah. I just don't, I don't look at gear that way. I don't, I almost yeah. never even A, B between like hardware and its plug-in counterpart. I just know uh -huh. that that's a compressor and it's got that kind of characteristic and I can grab that and it's going to do X and Y when I need it. And yeah. How, how would you AB that with Blue Cat? Like, and put, put the <laughs> AU in, in a Pro Tools well, session? No, you you just take any file, process with one, then process another with another format, reverse the phase and see if they null. And the answer is yes. They'll, they'll all null if they're done properly. Uh -huh. Someone could be completely wrong. Keep in mind, when, when we do these plugins, is usually... You know, like if someone's using a juice format, it automatically will take your code and package it in the different plugin formats. Wow. Uh, the only thing that was different was the 48 bit fixed integer uh, um, plugins from, uh, Pro, from Pro Tools. That was a different type of code. It was just different math. I see. That is that the, <laughs> a, the AAX? No, AAX is uh, still a name format. There's a, an AAX. Uh, before AAX, it was called TDM. It yeah, was TDM. Oh, yeah. Uh, 48 uh, fixed uh, fixed point there was an issue right i don't know i mean i was like i told you i was using slate way early on and uh a lot of studios i worked at they won't upgrade their systems and we'd be on the old tdm systems a lot and sometimes it would uh crash pro tools or fight was that because of 32 bit 64 bit who knows? I mean, it could be a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, yeah. systems are weird if you got or that forty-eight old operating systems and new plugins and all this kind of stuff. I mean, Facts. you've got a lot of different applications trying to play nice together, and it very rarely works out perfectly. Right. That's That's true. True. <laughs> hey, you have to remember every plugin is a different company with their own code, and every doll is another company with their own code so you're if you think about it any given session is hundreds of companies working together it's, it's a miracle man, man that it's a I miracle really our think. stuff works <laughs> that's true yeah it really is if you knew that what goes on behind it it really is a miracle i mean we spend a lot of r&d money working to mitigate that issue making sure that the plugins work in the different formats and the different os operating systems and you know, VSX is currently, I, I can't know if, I don't know if we released it yet, but we're M1 Pro Tools in beta and that's a whole other thing. And yeah, these things cost money to, to develop. Yeah. Yeah, the legend has it. If you leave Pro Tools running with no plugins or something, it'll go for like 3,000 days or something <laughs> like that. Like it's, it, it really is all dependent on all the companies that are kind of playing together with it. Um, so, it, you know, hats off to, again, to the manufacturers, hats off to pro tools. Y'all all have to somehow figure out a way to play nice, but you, you really do have to bite the bullet and figure out what, what's causing these bugs. You got to take and accept bugs from everywhere and try and figure it out. It's ridiculous in my opinion, but that, Hey, that without that, we can't work. So for sure. Probably I, the I, least fun part about what we do. Yeah. I accept it, man, because like I like to try, like Bob said, I like just to be like on the edge of what's new and keep up to date with stuff. So that that comes with the territory. It comes with, you know, troubleshooting and, you know, crashes and testing things. Yeah, we with uh, Mixing Night Audio, we've been almost finished with our second plugin. We're almost in alpha now. And I mean, developing plugins for us has been the funnest. It's been a Ooh. nightmare 
technically to try and get everything done and figure it out and get the graphics but man uh you know i'm i'm basically building plugins to solve my own problems so i take a bunch of things that i already do and put them under the hood and make them work with different components and make it sound cool. great and what i found is it's replacing so many of my other uh things but just going through the process of of trying to build it as man uh, it's uh it's super fun but my god getting that shit to market i don't know how you did it steven uh, hats off to you man well i'm looking forward to hearing your stuff i bet you it's gonna be great I, I, I find that successful producers mixers usually make the best stuff facts i'm i'm finding ours is working out really well like that's that's the best feeling like i sent our first one over to bob horn and you know he's freaking out over it and raving like for me as a as a creator that's the best feeling like oh shit i built something that i love but everybody else thinks it is too so, yeah i'm anxious for, the, for your next one though oh you're your next one sounds like it's it's gonna be great <laughs> so stupid <laughs> You hit, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. We're just trying to solve our own problems, you know? Um, that's where the best innovation comes. I agree. My first plugin is going to be just a simple, basic compressor, but it's going to post dad jokes on your screen uh, like every every 10 minutes. <laughs> you and I are going to get along great, Bob. <laughs> I, f I definitely follow uh, dad jokes on IG. Just lighting up your day, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not I'm not even a dad and I love <laughs> it's great. It's like the Galactica. You guys know there's a Galactica and Pro Tools, right? A what? Yeah. The newest Pro Tools has a full on video game. There's a special code to get to it. I played it for like two hours one time. Stop it was my playing, first run. I don't, don't want to know. I Stop shit you playing, I know. Just, I'll just give you that little tidbit of information. I'll let y'all do the research on your own. No, nope. but that reminds me of nope. Pong on the SSL back in the day. It yeah. is, it literally is that. So it's not Pong. I, I don't know if they have more than one game, but it's you know, little little airplane goes around, you shoot the, the asteroids, which are Pro Tools logos and stuff. That's dangerous. It's, That's dangerous. I know, I know. It's pretty rad. So I'll leave you with that piece of information. We're getting to the top <laughs> of the hour. Guys, I really, really appreciate you joining us, Steven Slate legendary you've done so much for us you've definitely influenced an entire generation of oh, not man, only true. music but music makers we oh, appreciate thanks, you sincerely yeah, thanks for the tools um guys my co-host ken lewis bob horn farid salama legendary legendary folks in in the house appreciate you guys very much myself nico hamui logging off for faders of the lost art you guys rock. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for tuning with, in with us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank you, Steve. Uh, Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. No. Don't forget to share, comment, like, and subscribe. And see you next time on Faders of the Lost Art.